In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our text this morning is from John chapter 1. It's a wonderful text that explains who Christ is and what he came to do and how he is full of grace for you and for me, that we might be saved and even become God's children. And so let's do our best to put aside all the excitement and worry of the Christmas season. Let's go through our text carefully that we might understand this Christ and properly believe in him and so be considered a child of God. Our gospel text begins with these words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now with these simple words that John records, he begins to explore for us the mystery of Christ, who is none other than God himself, and he uses the word with a capital W to refer to Jesus. And theologians have argued how much, if at all, John borrows from pagan, platonic, Greek philosophy when he refers to Jesus as the Word. I think he borrows nothing at all from Greek philosophy when he refers to Jesus as the Word, capital W. And in part, that's because this Word, Word, or logos, as you see printed in Greek on the beginning of uh, on the front of your bulletin, can be translated as speech. And John is cleverly connecting the pre-existent Christ with God's work in creation, as recorded in Genesis, says when God spoke things into existence. In fact, John goes on to talk about all things were made through this word. In fact. John, by referring to Jesus as the Word, capital w, w, alerts us to the fact that all God's Word points to Jesus himself. After all, Jesus said to the Jew, Jews, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me. If you're reading the scriptures, and you ought to be, and you're not coming to Christ and arriving at Christ and understanding Christ in the words of Scripture and even in between the lines of Scripture, then you're reading it wrongly. Jesus is the Word, capital W. Now in these first two verses of John, Jesus is clearly pictured as having a pre-existence with God. In the beginning, John writes, recalling our attention to Genesis chapter 1, but also indicating that Jesus existed before time and before the creation of the matter, creation of matter. Jesus is the Son of God. And John makes that clear later on in chapter 1 that Jesus is the Son. But here's the thing you have to understand. Jesus has always existed as the Son, and so has God the Father, always existed as God the Father. There was never a time that the Father and the Son never existed. And so then you might ask me, well, why is it then that the Bible speaks of Jesus as the only begotten Son? In our natural human thinking, we think of something being begotten as having a beginning, but this is referring to Jesus' eternal divine birth. And so it's appropriate to speak of it couple different births of Jesus Christ. The first that we have to understand is his eternal birth as the Son of God. Jesus Christ is begotten of his Father before all worlds, as we just confessed in the Nicene Creed. But again, this is an eternal birth. It never happened in time. God the Father has always been the Father of his Son. So we're beginning to explore the great mystery and wonder of the Trinity when we look at this passage and consider Jesus' existence as the Son of God. He is eternally begotten. Now the second birth of Jesus that we can speak of is his physical birth in the womb of the Virgin Mary. 
or from the womb of the Virgin Mary. And John refers to this clearly in verse 14 of our text when he wrote that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And unlike Jesus' divine birth, Jesus' physical birth is something that happened in time. There was a time when Jesus was not enfleshed. But since that time, he has been enfleshed. And Christmas time usually focuses on this physical birth of Jesus Christ. And this is a good and proper thing to do. But we must not forget Jesus' existence as the eternally birthed, the eternally begotten Son of God. Because if we miss out on that, we will miss out on his work on the cross which was a divine work that actually accomplished for us the forgiveness of sins. And so John chapter 1, which is the appointed text and has been for a long time, the appointed text for Christmas Day is meant to alert us to the fact that Jesus' physical birth was preceded by his eternally begotten birth as the Son of God. And we begin to explore then the mystery and wonder of the blessed Holy Trinity. And even in our text later, we have reference to the Father. And they, we have reference to the Son. Later in John's Gospel, we have numerous references to the Holy Spirit, whom God was going to give to all believers upon Jesus' ascension. And so there we have it in John's Gospel, the most elaborate discussion of the mystery of the Blessed Holy Trinity. And the fact that Jesus is begotten, not made, is meant to shake us up and listen. It means that this man, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was a carpenter, died and rose again, and ascended into heaven is no ordinary man. It means we ought to straighten up and hear his words. It's appropriate then to stand during the gospel lesson. This is Jesus, the eternally begotten Son of God, who was enfleshed and spoke to us. Also, should we be alert when his messengers, the faithful pastor, speaks? They are aren't even ordinary words too. Now backing up a little bit, consider verses 3 and 4. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Again, here John is equating Jesus with the very creator of the universe who made all things. And if we are following John's train of thought, starting with verse 1, Jesus at, at this point in verse 3, is not all that comforting because he's only described here as being one with God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. But when John begins to explain how this Christ, this Son of God, the divine word, was the life and light of men, then the comfort of the gospel starts to come out. Jesus is the light and life of men. We know it's easy to grasp that light is something good and life-giving. Without light, there is no photosynthesis. There's no plants. There's nothing to eat. There's no life. There's no heat. There's no warmth. From this, we can grasp what it means that Jesus is the light of men. He's that which gives life. Likewise, it's easy to grasp the figurative meaning of darkness. Darkness symbolizes death, evil, and the devil himself. And so the gospel becomes comforting and is filled out in John's gospel here in chapter 1 when he begins to explain Jesus is the life and light of men. The Son of God came to this earth, friends that you might have light and life and to help you and me and all people be brought out of darkness, brought out of slavery to the devil and made clean and holy and good. And to be able to live forever. And the world does not grasp this good news of the Christ who came to this earth as the light and life of men to bring us salvation. And this is because people 
the world does not feel it needs saving. Not really. For the great majority of people, the only saving they think they need is getting saved from bad health or getting delivered out of financial debt. But we must not think this way about Christ and his work of salvation. We need real saving. We poor sinners need a real savior. Not one that simply gives us money, but one that gives us peace with God and the forgiveness of sins. And not one that saves us from financial ruin, but one that saves us from the devil and eternal ruin, hell itself. And this is just who Christ is, the real Savior, who is the life and light of all mankind. Hallelujah. The, uh, the Apostle John's next words in our Gospel text are about John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. And here we understand clearly as we have already in the past few Sundays that John the Baptist was not Christ himself but came to bear witness to the light and this is important because all true Christian preachers pattern themselves after John the Baptist. We Christian preachers learn from this text, John chapter 1, our whole purpose, which is like John's, to bear witness to the light and point people to the Christ that they might believe in him, not in Clint Hoff. And so beware of the preacher who tells jokes and stories but never tells you to repent and turn from selfishness and believe in the Christ who was crucified for you and for all people. Because if he fails to preach repentance and faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, he's no Christian preacher at all, but a sham one. Our gospel text continues, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And here we learn several sublime and wonderful things. Jesus is the true light for everyone. And through faith in him, he gives the right to become children of God, which is a privilege that only believers have. It means they are protected by God, they're provided for by God. But let me focus on John's point that Jesus, as the true light, gives light to everyone. It's sad that there are preachers peddling themselves and their message under the name of Christian who reject this passage. That Jesus is the great gift to all mankind to save us from our sin and destruction. The liberal church does this, where universalism is taught that preaches that Jesus is really just one Savior among many and not even a very good Savior at that. And other religions have their own saviors, and how dare we criticize those religions who have a different Savior? Their saviors are just as legitimate or even more legitimate than Christ. But this is all such unchristian, uncredal, ungospel of John nonsense. Such preachers who preach a Christ who is not the light for everyone have denied Christ, who says clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Friends, your Jesus is the Jesus for the Chinese, for the Muslim, for the African, for everybody. 
whether they have accepted him or not. And so if you have friends or family who aren't believing in the one true Christ, plead with them to get out of whatever sinking ship they're in, whether it's the liberal church or atheism or some other false religion. Perhaps God in his grace will allow your preaching to your friends and family who are caught up in a church that doesn't preach Christ and give them true repentance, but maybe not. In any case, you will have done your duty to preach according to your vocation, whether people listen or not. Friends, the good news is that God has become a man in Jesus Christ for everyone, and anybody who believes in this Son is saved and becomes a child of God. This is good news. The sad irony of John's text here is that Jesus came to his own people, the Jews who did not receive him. This is a tragic irony, and the world is full of tragic ironies, and this is one of the greatest. That the very ones who were given the charge to keep and transmit God's word, which promised the Christ, did not receive him when the Christ came. And let's learn a good hard lesson from this. The punishment of those who rejected Christ, who is written in their scriptures, the Jews, was the destruction of their nation and their temple in 70 A.D. by the Romans. The Jews, on the whole, had rejected Jesus, and such fiery destruction awaits anybody who rejects this Christ. Let's take alert, be alert, and so listen to the faithful preacher like John and the apostles who preached faith. In this Christ. Now, our text closes with these words, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And here's pure comforting gospel again, friends, something where it's made crystal clear. Jesus is full of grace and truth. He's the great mediator that brings us peace with God, that establishes for us forgiveness of sins who is the only one who is able to make us holy I've mentioned this in the past that this passage in our text John 1 14 that the word became flesh is beautiful condescension in the good sense condescension when someone high and mighty stoops down to benefit someone who's much lower in this case, it's speaking of the holy and perfect God stooping down to become like one of us, poor sinners, in order to save us. And John says in his gospel, I'm a witness to this. I saw it. He was an eyewitness of Jesus' miracles, his death, his resurrection, and even his ascension. And so John chapter 1 on this Christmas day serves to teach us that the God of the universe, Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, really does love us. And he became one of us in the person of Jesus Christ. For what reason? That we might have grace and the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. It's a promise that's given to all who believe in him. Rejoice with me, friends, this Christmas day. Amen. The peace of God that transcends all understanding. God, your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the offertory.